Binding of Isaac, the story of Akedat Yitzchak, a famous story where Abraham, God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and bring him as a sacrifice. And in the last minute, right before he pulled the knife and right before he slaughtered him, God said, don't, don't touch him, don't even make a blemish on him, leave him alive. <clears throat> so this story is a famous, maybe one of the most famous or very famous story in the Bible, in the Torah. Much has been said about it, discussed about it, and discussed by skeptics or by critics on the one hand, and on the other hand, by believers also. It is a very, it's a story that is a... I'm yeah. sorry, I have a question. Did God tell him not to do it, or was it an angel? It was an angel of God. Angel, angel of God. God. He's a messenger. No, but, but yeah. God told him to do it, but then he told he the, angel the angel to stop right. it. Yeah. But the angel is his uh, messenger. Right, 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 correct. So, yeah, much discussion has been spoken about this story, which appears by the end of this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is Vayera, like, which means, and he appeared, which is named after the opening episode where Hashem appears to Abraham after his Brit Milah, after he had the after he was circumcised, but all the way by the end of the Torah portion, after he had a son at the old age, at his old age, and he had his, his single son, then by the end of the Torah portion, which was Isaac, Hashem tells him this story, please take your son, your only son, and bring him as an offering to me on the place I'll show you. And finally, when they finally get there and he sets up the altar, he sets up the wood and he's holding the knife to his throat. That's when the angel comes and says, don't do it. Don't touch him. This story as shocking or surprising it may be, the Don Yitzchak Abarbanel says about it, We'll look in the source sheet. He says that right on the first source, the medieval scholar, he writes, in the binding of Isaac lies the entire glory of Israel and their merit before their father and heaven. And that is why it pervades our prayer every day. Every single day, every morning, we met in the shacharit, in the in the morning prayer, we mentioned the binding of Isaac. And the way he explains the reason is because in this story lies the entire glory of Israel. This is obviously a very extreme words that the entire and shows us how special and important is this episode. And therefore we're saying that in this story, the entire the entire glory of Israel lies in this, in this, um, in this story. And obviously, the question is why? What's so special about it? What is what is so unique about this story that, therefore, we say that uh, that in this story lies the entire glory? As we'll soon see, some approaches to this matter. Obviously, the main question that probably bothers people while learning this story is what exactly is happening here? Isn't God the God of life? He doesn't want us to hurt ourselves. He says, that we should live in the mitzvot. We should not, we should not do anything that endangers our life. There's a special commandment that you should guard your life very carefully 
not too many commandments have that word very. Many commandments say, do this, don't do this. But when it comes to guarding one's life, the Torah says it. In Hebrew, that you should guard your life very, in, a very, in an extreme matter. Be very careful with your life. So it's the God that's all about life, that's all about living. And all of a sudden, he's telling Abraham, the first of the nation, of the Jewish nation, oh, bring your son as a sacrifice. Isn't that a ritual that we know that the pagans did, which Abraham was fighting against and you know, sort of revolting against those pagan rituals and, and, uh, and customs of killing their children or, think, or human sacrifice. So how was it that God told him this? Okay, in the last minute it turned around. But what was happening to begin with? So it's important to notice that in a certain sense, reading the story, we almost could, the story was unfolding in two realms. There was God's view on the story and what Abraham was experiencing. Let's take a close look at the opening verses of, of the Torah, where it discusses of, the, of this story of the binding of Isaac. Number two in this source sheet. And God said, Please take your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac, and go away to the land of Maria and bring him up there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Or more precise, probably as a, for an offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So the sages zoom into this term, bring him up, and they say the following. Actually, they describe a discussion. Rabbi, that, yeah. can, can you make the source sheet larger? Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Is it good now? Yeah, And they actually describe a discussion that took place between Abraham and God. By the end, after the, after the angel came to him and said, do not bring him as an offering. So then the, the sages said like this, source three, said Rabbi Abba, Abraham said to him, I will explain my complaint before you. Yesterday you said to me, for in Isaac will be called your seed. Even though Abraham had another son from a different wife, Yishmael. But God told him in last week's Torah portion, Isaac is going to be your true descendant. And your, your life's mission and your legacy would pass through Isaac. So that's what it means for an Isaac will be called your seed. And a few days ago, you retracted and said, take your son and bring him as an offering. Now you say to me, do not stretch forth your hand to the lad. So what exactly is happening here? First, Isaac is going to be your son and your, your descendants will come, will come from him. And your legacy would continue through him. And now you retract and you say, take your son. And then three days later, you say, oh, do not stretch your hand to your son. What's happening here? The Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, I shall not profane my covenant, neither shall I alter my utterance of my lips. When I said to you, take, I was not altering the, utter the utterance of my lips. I did not say to you, slaughter him, but bring him up. But bring him up. You have brought him up. Now take him down. So what God said, in a certain sense, I didn't, I almost tricked you, if we could use such a term. 
I, I, you, I, I, I precisely framed my request from you by saying, take him, bring him up. I didn't say slaughter him. If I would have said slaughter him, so then you'd be like, oh, slaughter him, don't slaughter him. Kill him or don't kill him. But now all I said is take him up, bring him there, dedicate him. And now you brought him up, you did my command. Yes, you understood bring him up in the literal sense as, God forbid, burning him. But that's not what I said. All I said is bring him up and now I'm clarifying. Meaning that there was never a point in the story that God wanted Isaac to actually be killed. That never happened. It was a setup to test Abraham. Abraham to think that he was supposed to do a certain action and see if he would be ready to do that act, that action. And then God saying, oh, that's what you thought. And I'm very happy you're ready to do it. But that's not my intention. I don't want you to do it. And that's essentially the, the, the core of the test. The test is almost get, putting Abraham in a fake reality for him to think that Hashem wants him to do a certain thing but then last minute talk and making seeing if he's ready for it and then saying oh no, no that's not what I meant I just wanted to see your level of commitment so with this this sort of gives us a a picture on the story how the story is really unfolding on two levels on God's level there was never a there's never even a thought to slaughter someone. On Abraham's level, who was being tested, that's where God said, that's where he was made to think. He was led to think that he was supposed to slaughter him to see, to see if he's ready to do that. And then last minute, everything changing and Hashem saying, don't send, stretch your hand to the lad. Now, this obviously, yeah, is this clear? All right. So this obviously brings forth another question. There's nothing in all of this that's clear, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, yeah. I, that was, I was going to say, what was God testing Abraham for? Why? Okay, so we'll, we'll get to it in a moment. Sorry. Wait a second. Yeah, have a question? Yeah. Uh, the question is uh, that I still am not getting uh, answers, I guess, to... All right, so this entire thing happens. Uh, Abraham takes the knife. He's about to do what he was going to do. And it says, uh, an, an angel of Hashem comes and basically says, stop, don't do, etc. And he said, and the angel says, it doesn't say Hashem uh, knows that, you know, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're doing exactly uh, that uh, um, you have complete faith in Hashem. It's, instead, he says, Ata yadati ki Elohim ata. Now I know, meaning the angel knows. So my response is, who the hell cares? This is not, you know, uh, I have nothing, uh, there's no connection with you. My connection is with Hashem. Why do I have to prove to you that, so that you now know that you, that I am a God-fearing individual? And the other, the other, uh, the other question is, who is the angel that is, that is saying all of this? Right, so... That, and there's also more, because if you have Meir of the Talmud, Lifnei Mishayimim, 
Hashem tells you to do something, and now you just have an angel telling you to stop. How could he listen? That That's beside the point. Oh, sorry, beside that. Okay. I mean, you can bring that up as a second, as a, as the next right. round of that's questions that uh, nice. that Rabbi Steinmetz can respond to. All right. So there's a few points here. First of all, I think <laughs> it's I think it's pretty um, accepted that an angel of God is God's messenger, and when He is speaking to Abraham as a messenger. He is conveying Hashem's message to Abraham, not his own message. So when he's saying, Ata Yadaiti, now I know that you're a God-fearing person. He is saying that in the name of Hashem, that Hashem knows now. Okay. That's, that's, that's the first point, that the angel is not his own independent being, meaning, and when he's doing a message, a mess, when he's doing a, when he's doing a... When he's giving a message over. When he's okay. giving a message over, when he's fulfilling some uh, something that he's sent to do. So he is a angel of Hashem. So much so, the, 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 the rabbis point out that sometimes the angels get certain names of Hashem. Because they're totally here when they're out doing, when they're fulfilling a, 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 um, a job that they're supposed to do. So they are... To, they're just a channel for Hashem's words and message to be brought through them. Now, there's another question, which I think you also picked up on. What do you mean, now I know you're a God-fearing person? Which is actually one of the points that I want to, well, that we want to discuss today. So, so Rabbi, Rabbi... Up until Rabbi. now, Hashem didn't know. Doesn't he know who Abraham is? Didn't he, Abraham... Didn't Abraham serve him for almost, I don't know, almost 100 years at this point? More. So, well, no. Yitzchak was already 42. It's 140 years. 37. 40. 37 when, I, when he went up. Yeah, 37. Remember. Right. Okay, but Rabbi. And then Abraham. Why, why wouldn't when Abraham he say. To serve Hashem, what? Why, wouldn't, why wouldn't he say, you know, why is he saying. Ata yadati. Now I know. Why doesn't he say, Ata Hashem? You know, why doesn't he say Hashem? I, th I think he's speaking in the name of Hashem. That's what I'm saying. He's speaking in the name of Hashem. Yeah, but why is he only saying that the second time? First time he just says, Stop. Then it says later, later the Malach called back and said, Binish Patinu Hashem. Right. So. That's right. the second time. He should have right. said that the first time. So the, one of the rabbis explained that there was a conversation going on, right? That Abraham said, let me do a small thing. So I said, no, no, no. Everything is already accomplished. I, 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 the point of this test was to see if you're a God-fearing person, as we'll explain later. And now don't do anything because the, the whole purpose of the test was accomplished. So he wanted to make like a small blemish. So said, no, we already accomplished everything that needs to be done. And he gave him the blessings and they went back. Okay, so let's, let's uh, to answer, begin our... To answer the two questions, I would say Abraham understands more than we understand. So if the angel says, now you're dirty, he knows he speaks in the name of God. He does need an explanation, additional explanation. He stops correct. and he knows it's it's in shame in the name of God. Yeah, correct. Rabbi. Yeah. It was Moshe, I think it was signed, sealed, and delivered once the test was done because that was a real test to see whether or not he was going to sacrifice Yitzhak. Because you know, he came from a from a from a, a country where pagan sacrifices were carried out. He comes to, to this point where he's being tested to see if he'll actually do it, and he didn't do it. Something stopped. It, it stopped. Hashem stopped him from doing it. So it shows a struggle, another struggle between him and Hashem that um, prevented him from carrying out the same kind of sacrifices that they did in, in those lands that carried out pagan, pagan sacrifices. So it was a real test. That was a major test. All right. 
Well, like we'll, we'll, we'll soon see. So let's, we'll get many of the points that were brought up, we're going to get back to and maybe and uh, discuss it from maybe a slightly from different angles. We'll get back to it. So we have here a story like we just we just laid out a story that has two realms on on the on the um, from God's side of from God's view. There's never a reason. There's no intention to, for Isaac to be slaughtered. He said, "Bring him up." He didn't say slaughter him. Just bring him up, dedicate him to test Abraham. For Abraham, there's a real struggle. Should he do it? Is he going to do it? Should he not? So I think one of the questions, as soon as we, we think about that God tested Abraham, is what's the point of the test? Doesn't Hashem know Abraham? Doesn't he know his strengths and his weaknesses? And if he's able to accomplish what he's able to accomplish and how he could, um, what he's able to accomplish and, and his dedication to him. So why does Hashem have to test them all together? Rabbi Steinman? Yeah. <clears throat> I just want to say that with regard to the angel speaking on behalf of Hashem, I've, I've always understood or I've been told that angels are something in the order of robots for Hashem. In other words, they're like servants or automatons that are just created to do the bidding of Hashem so that that would have been understood by Abraham Avinu. Right. In other words, that he was actually he was speaking on behalf of Hashem. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is true. Especially when they're doing, when, they, when they're sent in, a, in a, when they're sent to do something, then they're really just conveying Hashem's message somewhat like a robot. To make things even uh, even less understood, besides for the general idea of why does Hashem have to test Abraham, there is, the rabbis say, have another explanation on the opening verse of the binding of Isaac, and they say the following. If we look closely at the, at the verse, yeah, the number two is a quote from the Torah. God said to him, please take your son, your only son whom you love. It's, it's the, the request starts with this please. There's many times Hashem asked different things from Abraham and didn't say please. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind is, yeah, because here we're asking for something. We're not just asking to travel which is really hard to leave your comfort, leave your, the place you grew up, leave the place you live, and to travel to an unknown place. True, that's a test, and it's a hard test. But that, you can't compare that to, God forbid, slaughtering your only child. So maybe that's why they say, he, Hashem said, please. But the rabbis say even a deeper idea. They say, number four, he said to him, he, God said to him, I beg of you, Pass this test for me so that people will not say that the first ones, the first test had no substance. People might, if you fail this test, people will say, you failed this one. The other ones are also not worthless. They're also worthless, not worth anything. Obviously, this is so hard to understand. What does this mean? The other tests are worthless. Abraham was tested nine times. He even, his life was threatened against the mighty king of Nimrod for his belief in Hashem. He was thrown into a fiery furnace. He needed a miracle to save him. Hashem said at the age of 75, pick up and go. And he went and so on and so forth. Nine tests. So what if he, let's say he failed this one. Let's say he would say, Hashem will come to him and say, sacrifice your son. And he'll say, Abraham will say, sorry, this one I'm not ready to do. So what would people say? Abraham is devoted, very, very devoted. He passed nine of them. This tenth one he wasn't ready to do. 
But but how? But but you see, the rabbis are not saying that. They're saying that this test is something so special. Not only it is a test on its own, but it validates the earlier tests. Why? Why are the earlier tests? What could? What blemish? so to speak, can we find in the earlier tests that this final test validates the earlier tests? And this again is in sync with what the Abar Benel said, what we started the class with, that this story is something very special, the glory of Israel, this is their merit, Meaning this is just, he doesn't say it about the other nine tests. He says it about this one. Meaning this is something very, very special and very unique. And therefore it also validates the earlier test, which is something that we have to understand. Right, so let's let's just summarize what we spoke so far. We started to speak about the story that is recorded in the end of this week's Torah portion. That God told Abraham to take his son as a, to bring his son up as a sacrifice. And last minute, God told him through a messenger, through an angel, do not stretch your hand to this, to your son. Do not even make a blemish. Do not touch him. Don't even make a cut on him. Don't even cut a small cut. Don't even let a drop of blood um, from him. And we explain that if you look if you look closely, God never really said to slaughter him. God said bring him up. So on on the on the one hand, on God's from God's point of view, there was never even a, a thought to slaughter Abraham. He never even changed his mind. The whole time he didn't slaughter Isaac. It's the whole time it was just a test. On the other hand, Abraham had this really hard test. Is he so dedicated to Hashem that he's ready even to, God forbid, slaughter his own son? We brought a, a medrash, what the rabbis say, actually in the Talmud, that God pleaded by Abraham past this test so they shouldn't say the first, the, the first nine tests were worthless, which obviously is not understood. The first nine tests was such hard test. Why, if he doesn't pass this final 10th test, which yes, we understand it's a very hard test, the first nine were worthless. So let's speak a little bit about a test. In Hebrew, a nisayon, a test. Why does God need a test? Doesn't he know who we are? Doesn't he know our capabilities, our strong points and our weak points? A teacher tests his students because the teacher does not know where his students are holding. Yes, he taught for a week, for a month, for a semester, and now he wants to test them to see if they really understood the information, if they absorb the information, if they could give over the information. So that's the test for the teacher, for the teacher to know. But why does God have to test us? Doesn't he know? One of the explanations is a test Actually, the Hebrew word for test, the root of the word, nisayon, are the two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, nun samach, which is also nes, which can mean a miracle. And also can mean being raised up higher. Like a flag that is raised up high. Arim nisi, the verse says, I'll raise you up. So a nace or a test, the objective is to raise someone higher than his, than what he thinks his capabilities are. Many tests, when a person is tested by Hashem, in his mind, 
rationally he cannot accomplish this test. It is not something rational. It's not something that he thinks he's able to do from the way he estimates himself and the way he views himself. Only when he disregards his self-judgment and disregards what he thinks the conclusion would be or should be based on how he knows himself and he goes forth and does it, only then does he realize that he really had the capabilities all along. And he reveals in his life those capabilities that he had. So the point of the test is not for God to find out what the person's capabilities are, which he knows, but rather for the pers person himself to reveal, for the person himself to reveal in himself those powers that he really has. And, but very, very deep in a way that he himself sometimes doesn't even know he has them. And there are different types of tests. There may be tests that would show him, give him a deeper meaning in life. There may be tests that could, that there are things that he thinks he can't do, but when he just went ahead and did it anyways, the person realized that he was able to do it. But the point of the test is for, to elevate the person higher than himself, higher than he views himself, and many times higher than he is. Meaning until he passed the test, until the, he had that struggle, he was a certain way. But after the struggle, he came out stronger and better than he was before. So too is when we speak about God testing Abraham. The point of these tests are to bring out something deeper in Abraham's character, life. To that when he when he passed the test, he achieved something that could be even be rationally he wasn't able to achieve before, or he didn't think he was able to achieve before. He broke certain boundaries in his life. But what exactly are the boundaries that we're talking about? What are the boundaries that Abraham broke through the binding of Isaac? Through, meaning through passing these tests. It was quoted earlier uh, that after the test, the angel told Abraham, now I know that you're a God-fearing person. And beforehand, well, he wasn't God-fearing. The first nine tests, he, he wasn't a God-fearing person. One of the explanations offered, which the Rebbe said, based on an idea that was developed by the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, is that Abraham, the different, the different forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, maybe we'll discuss this in coming weeks at length, really represented different types of service of Hashem. Abraham, as we know, and we spoke about in the past, he was kind. He's, he, he, he excelled in his kindness in stretching out an arm to people, helping people in his inviting guests, his achnasat orchim. The, the verse called, refers to him as Avraham Ohavi, Avram, my beloved. 
he really served God in the way and with through love, through being kind. Isaac, on the other hand, represents the other extreme, the extreme of Gvura, could be tra loosely translated as strictness, as strength. And he served God on that, with that channel. That's a way, being very strict, being very careful, being very meticulous about what you do, which is really a different character trait than being kind and nice and expansive, or rather being strict. So they really had different characteristics. Their character was different. And they also served God in different ways. Abraham traveled around and let people and taught people about the, the name of God. Isaac never left Israel. Isaac was relatively stayed in one place. Rabbi, he did yeah. I'm sorry to inter interrupt. Do you believe that uh, Yitzhak's being more machmir and gaburdik was a result of the the um, Akedah? Do you believe that maybe this, when he found out what, what happened, that this it was once so, this was ingrained in him, that this would cause him to be more Gevora? Right. No, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's because or if it goes hand in hand. It's probably hard to pinpoint what's the cause, what's the effect, right? But it definitely goes hand in hand. This is a more of a Gevora story, right? More of a strict story, not so much the love kindness type of story. So it definitely goes hand in hand with Isaac's theme. I don't know I if this is the, basically see the right, trigger so, point. I don't the know if this is the point. trigger point, but it, it goes hand in hand. So Abraham is referred to as the one that serves God out of love, with love. And, the, and each one of the forefathers really serve God with a different attribute based on their character. Now, with this in mind, we could understand what God is saying. Now I know that you fear me. Up until this point, everything you did was out of love. We didn't see you serve God above your nature, above what you're used to. You use your character for service of Hashem. Yes, that's a very, very special thing to fully use your, your habits and your character to serve Hashem. However, we didn't see you go above and beyond yourself. We didn't see you serve Hashem from a different point from a different um, from an opposite character trait which may very well mean that your service of Hashem is so, so almost natural there are some people that are just just like you know there's some people that are naturally rule followers they just can't break rules there's some people that don't have that so someone who's a rule follower Yes, it's very important that, he, and it's great that he's keeping all the rules, but you don't see him, the, the quality of someone that works on himself, and a, let's say it comes hard, and he obtains a certain good character trait, you don't have that advantage, which is something very special. Someone who's able to work on himself, and so to speak, his habit or his nature is not to have, let's say, a certain good character trait. And he attained that and he really worked himself to, to get there. That is something very praiseworthy. So someone who's naturally has those good character traits, right? It's not saying, <laughs> not saying he should leave it, God forbid. But he doesn't, he, for him to work, he will have to work even harder. So over here, Abraham was serving God out of love the whole time. He really is missing the service. He's really missing the aspect of fear, which is also a, a, a fear quality and way of serving Hashem. And we could, someone might argue that he is just serving God out of his nature. 
to illustrate this point, and then we'll get back to it, there's a story in the Talmud. I originally, I copied it onto the source sheet, but then last minute I forgot to save it. I X'd it and it didn't save. And that's why the class started a few minutes late. So may, I'll, I'll read it to you from, a, from online in English. So it's not on the source sheet, but it's, I'll see if I'm able to find it. Um, a very fascinating story, which the Talmud All right, got it. Talmud's taught, the Talmud mentions, and I think it would illustrate this point. Um, okay, so it's over here where it says the sage is taught. Make it a little bigger. The story, this, the story is Rabbi Yosef, Yossi ben Kisma, a sage from the first century, about, he says, the sage, the sage is taught. When Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma fell ill, Rabbi Hanina ben Tradi went to visit him. His friend was sick. So he went to visit his friend that was sick. Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma said to him, right, the one visiting, sorry, the one that was sick said to him, Hanina, my brother, do you know that this nation has been given reign by a decree of heaven, from heaven? The proof is that Rome has destroyed God's temple and burnt his sanctuary and killed his pious ones and destroyed his best ones, and it still exists. So obviously God wants the Romans to rule. Evidently, all this is by divine decree. And yet, I hear about you he tells Rabbi Hanina that you sit and engage in Torah study and convene assemblies in public and have a Torah scroll placed on your lap, which these are all things that the Romans made decrees against, thereby demonstrating complete disregard for the decrees issued by the Romans. The Rabbi Hanina responded, Rabbi Hanina ben Tradin said to him, heaven will have mercy and protect me. Rabbi Yesim ben Kisma says to him, I am saying reasonable matters to you, and you say to me, heaven will have mercy. I wonder if the Romans will not burn both you and your Torah scroll by fire, meaning you are endangering your life. Rabbi Yosim and Kisma tells Rabbi Hanina, this that you're studying and defying the rules of the, of the Romans, you are endangering your life. Okay. Now here, this is the most, the shocking part of the story. Rabbi Hanina, Ben Teradion, Rabbi Hanina, who is putting his life in danger to teach Torah, to make sure that Torah and, the, and God's word continues in the Jewish nation. So Abinina asked, said to him, my teacher, what will become of me? Am I, am I destined for the life of the world to come? If you ask me, and I think, I think if you ask anyone in the class, the answer is yes, of course. You're, you're teaching so much Torah. You're, you're endangering your life. You're putting your life in the lines in order to teach. Of course, you are, you, you will have a share in the world to come. But that's not what Rabbi Yosef and Kisma answered. Rabbi Yosef and Kisma said to him, any special incident occurred to you, which might serve as an indication? Menina ben Tradi said to him, I confused my own coins that I needed for the fest festivities of Purim with coins of charity. He had two bags of money. He accidentally mixed together his personal money with charity money. So what would most people do? Most people would probably start making calculations and say, okay, I know I had at least $100. And I know the charity was probably around 50. Okay, so I'll, give, I'll put 50 back in the charity box and 100 I'll keep for myself because that, that was my money. But I didn't do that. But rather, 
and I distribute them all to the poor on, at my own expense. So Rabbi Yosem and Kisma said to him, if that is so, may my portion, may, may my portion be of your portion and may my, my lot be of your lot. Meaning you have a share in the world to come. So that's the story the Talmud says, which is a, obviously this, this story raises eyebrows. What's happening here? You have here a person that is dedicating his life and putting his life in danger for something, for Torah. And nevertheless, he's not sure if you'll have a share in the world to come. And he only is, he's only assured that he's going to have a, a share in the world to come, meaning get rewarded. When, they tell, when he says, oh, I remember one time I mixed the charity money together and I gave on my own expense extra charity. What's happening in the story? What, and before that, let's say that story didn't happen. Then you, then, you, then you would doubt if you're worthy of great reward. So one of the explanations for the story is the following. There are many people that study. And there are many people that even endanger their life for what they study. The Greek philosophers, many of them were persecuted and they put their life in danger for studying the philosophy and for spreading the philosophy that they, that they, that they believed was true. So just by studying and by teaching, that could be a certain nature a person has. That could be a certain character that I'm a person that likes to study and teach and further my thoughts and nothing would stop me. Yes, that's a great thing. It's a very special thing that what I believe and what I, what I, this I like to study, nothing would stop me. But you still don't have that aspect that I broke my, that I broke my, my limitations, that I left my, I left my comfort zone. That could all be within my comfort zone. So what happened in the story is he's like, yes, I'm putting, I'm defying the decree of the Romans and I'm teaching Torah, but does that mean I'll get the real reward? Maybe that's just my natural, the, the way I am. Maybe that's all out of habit. That's not out of, I didn't really go out of my comfort zone for serving Hashem. So therefore, the response was, okay, so do you have a story that could indicate if you ever left your comfort zone? And then he said, yes, I have a story which is a totally different type of nature. There are people that naturally are, you know, the easy learners, they can sit for a long time. They're not such lively people. They're not so exciting. You know, that's not their nature. And it's easy for them to learn and teach for a long time. Then there's people many times of a different characteristic that they're excited and they help people and they go around and they, and they make, and they, and they take on different initiatives and they, so that is really a different characteristic. So when he said that, yes, I went and gave the money to the poor more than I needed to, says, so that's when Rabbi Yossi and Kisma said, aha, I see that you're not just serving out of your nature, which is, very, which is a great thing. But rather, I see that you're leaving your comfort zone and you're doing things that even don't fit with your habit and don't fit with your regular, with, with, the, way, with, with, with the habits that you have from the way you're born, your characteristic way you are. Rather, you worked on yourself and you, and you, and you attained even new um, you, you are able to incorporate into your being new and different character traits which aren't natural to you. You worked on yourself. You went out of your comfort zone. And that's exactly what God was telling Abraham. Now I know that you fear, you fear me. 
up until now, everything could have been out of love. Out of love, I would travel wherever you told me to travel. Out of love, I would spread your word to everyone and that, and that, and that um, be stopped by anything. But then there's something with a totally different, with a, on a totally different scale, side of the scale. Doing an action out of fear, an action that, sh that is the exact opposite of love. Doing an action that is totally non-characteristic for him, which is fear, which shows on strength. When he did that, now uh, this is what we're trying to get to. This is what the point of the test is, to reach something deeper. To show that I'm ready even to leave my comfort zone. To do what you want me to do. Up until then, he was serving God, so to speak, within his comfort zone. Yes. <laughs> to the, in a complete way. But here, where he did something which was opposite of his nature, that's when it was revealed. And he revealed within himself something totally beyond him that he started to serve Hashem or he expressed serving Hashem on a different, in a different way, in an opposite way. And that's what we said earlier that the point of a Nisayon, the point of a test is to bring out something deeper within a person. And in our case, to bring out that Abraham doesn't just serve Hashem out of love, which may mean that he's serving him out of character, but rather he's serving him because this is what Hashem wants. And even if it's not, and it doesn't fit my character, I still will do it. And that is something very special. And that is something that validates all the earlier tests. Before we ask, why, what does it mean that if he wouldn't have passed this one, the other test wouldn't have been validated? But this, now we could, get, we could gain some appreciation for it. Because what people would say is, oh, he did those tests because that's what he likes to do. But he never really served Hashem in something that was uncomfortable for him. Here, that he did something totally non-characteristic for who he was, that shows that he's not doing, he's not serving Hashem just because this is his nature, but rather he's serving him because this is what Hashem wants. And he went above and beyond his nature and that really tells me that all the times that he did that, that he listened, it was because it was based on what God wants, not just because he wanted to make a revolt. You know, some people that have that nature. And therefore, he made a problem in Nimrod, or therefore, he travels because he likes to wander. Because he did something that is non characteristic for him. Just to conclude, the the lesson, the takeaway that we have from this is that struggles are really, we have to try to, as hard as they are, and they're very hard, but many times we could we have to try and hope that we'll be able to succeed through the struggle and turn the struggle into a step, into a stepping, a step that we should reach higher and sometimes even learn something about ourselves that we didn't know before, that we didn't know we're able to do before. And use that to lift ourselves up to a higher level. And just, yeah, we'll go to questions in a minute, just to summarize what we spoke about today. So we spoke about the story of the binding of Isaac and how the, how really on the Hashem knew Abraham's capabilities and he knew, and he didn't even have intention for him to slaughter him. It was more a setup. And the point was to test Abraham, which means for Abraham to reveal something that he didn't have until then. And like we explained that after the binding of Isaac, that's when Hashem said, now I know that you are a God-fearing person. Meaning, now I know that 
you don't deserve it, serve me out of love in your comfort zone, but you also serve me out of your comfort zone, which is something very hard and something which is, which is very special. And therefore, this, this test really validated the earlier test and gives us appreciation for what and who Abraham was. Your same question, yeah. Hashem didn't know that Abraham goes beyond? Your original question, I don't think, was answered. No, Hashem, Hashem, Hashem know what Abraham's going to do. And your answer is? Right, so you're... In other words, it could be Hashem. No, but Hashem wants Abraham to know. Hashem wants to reveal it by him. So it was to reveal to Abraham what? And to everyone, yeah. So now it's revealed that you're God-fearing. Now it's revealed that you don't just serve me out of love, but you're God-fearing. You're able to get through that test. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're muted. What supports what you're saying about the two characteristics is that um, three times mentioned in this story is they went together. The first time is mentioned that Abraham went with Yitzhak together up the mountain. Two other times it was mentioned exactly where after that. And the thought there is exactly what you're saying is that Abraham was too, too much chesed and, and Yitzhak had too much kavora, and they were both out of balance. So right. when they went together in doing this thing, they came together in, as you're saying, that Yitzhak became more kind, you know, more chesed, because he, he submitted himself. And Abraham did the act of judgment, you know, <laughs> extreme. So I thought that was very interesting, or it backs right. up what you're saying. That's a very, yeah, very interesting observation. How you see how they went together, meaning they are different, but in this yeah, case, yeah, they both sort of met in the middle. That's right, exactly. Three times mentioned, so it's obviously very important. Yeah. So they were both, they both learned about themselves and they both, you know, it could go forward as balanced human beings. Right. Any other comments or questions? Bye -bye. Yeah. I hate to make a juxtapose situation like this, but the case of Stalin, you know, he came from a, a situation where he was studying to become a, a religious figure, I guess. Uh, I don't know whether it was a, um, a priest or a Jesuit or something. You know, to say that he had a calling to, uh, you know, to become the, a, a, very, a tyrant of Russia and, a lit, and kill, a polo, kill off most of his Politburo for a new Politburo that he replaced. And, and what he did with the, um, the you know, in the, in the rural areas uh, where food was, you know, where the farmers, he was actually killing the farmers off to strengthen Israel's, I mean, Israel, I'm saying, to strengthen Russia, you know, Mother Russia, make it, make it a stronger country. But, you know, he, he even took all their food in order to accomplish this goal. You know, can you say that that was a similar? It wasn't for love of God. I mean, it, I mean, it was he. He, in his mind, he think, thought maybe he had a, you know, he it was God's calling that he had to do what he did. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to make a comparison, but you know, it can be good or bad. It can lead to something good. You know, a great nation, as it was in the case of Israel, or it can become something like what happened in Russia, where many people were killed and and and, and slaughtered for Stalin's goal, you know, to attain power the way he did, you know what I'm saying? He crushed a lot of people, you know, he, like I said, he killed his Politburo and most of his Politburo off, replaced it. And, uh, you know, he, you could say right now, well, you know, look at Russia right now, it's, you know, it, you know, even Hitler, but more so in the case of Stalin, because Stalin, you know, it, it seemed to have a similar, you know, you can actually make it, uh, you know, an anachronism, and uh, you know, but this is political. You know, to me, it seems that there's a there's a comparison here of some sort, but it's in a negative way, <laughs> not in a positive way. You know, so how Shem works in a way that seems to be, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think Stalin had Hashem in mind when he did what he did. But he came from a religious background. That's the thing. He came from. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not in not his sure mind, very. 
No, I'm not saying. I'm not right. saying. That, I'm not sure if it's really um, but, connected or so much. But he actually said that it did come, I believe, from God. Okay. You know, Say what he wants. Um, saying to kill out so many people like that is really not a... <laughs> Not a religious not story. A proper, not a religious it's act. It's not a religious story. I understand. Is it because he wanted to? He wanted the strength and power. But these people, yeah, these tyrants who come into power, you know what I'm saying? It's it it, it 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 fascinates me because how do they reach that level of power without who's intervening to make it that way? You understand? That's what I'm trying yeah. to say. The people, people that study this to figure out how it comes about. <laughs> Right. Any other uh, comments, questions? Okay, so uh, we'll see everyone. So, 